we have had the honor for the last several years of hosting the annual Etel Adnan prize winner um, for our part of our poetry festival. And um, Etel Adnan died today at the age of 94. Um, so in honor of her, I'm gonna read a, a portion of um, a poem from the Spring Flowers own um, called The Morning After My Death. <clears throat> The morning after my death, we will sit in cafes, but I will not be there. I will not be. There was the great death of birds. The moon was consumed with fire. The stars were visible until noon. Green was the forest drenched with shadows. The roads were serpentine. A redwood tree stood alone with its lean and lit body, unable to follow the cars that went by with frenzy. A tree is always an immutable traveler. The moon darkened at dawn. The mountain quivered with anticipation and the ocean was double shaded. The blue of its surface with the blue of flowers mingled in horizontal water trails. There was a breeze to witness the hour. The sun darkened at the fifth hour of the day. The beach was covered with conversations. Pebbles started to pour into holes and waves came in like horses. The moon darkened on Christmas Eve. Angels ate lemons in illuminated churches. There was a blue rug planted with stars above our heads. Lemonade and war news competed for our attention. Our breath was warmer than the hills. There was a great slaughter of rocks of spring leaves, of creeks. The stars showed fully the last king of the mountain gave battle and got killed. We lay on the grass, covered dried blood with our bodies, green blades swayed between our teeth. We went out to see a bank of whales was heading south. A young man among us, a hero, tried to straddle one of the sea creatures whose body emerged as a muddy pool, as mud. We waved goodbye to his remnants, happy not to have to bury him in the early hours of the day. We got drunk in a bar room. The small town of Fairfax had just gone to bed. Cherry trees were bending under the weight of their flowers. They were involved in a ceremonial dance to which no one had ever been invited. I know flowers to be funeral companions. They make poisons and venoms and eat abandoned stone walls. I know flowers shine stronger than the sun. Their eclipse means the end of times, but I love flowers for their treachery. Their fragile bodies grace my imagination's avenues. Without their presence, my mind would be an unmarked grave. We met a great storm at sea looked back at the rocking cliffs, the sand was going under, black birds were leaving, the storm ate friends and foes alike, water turned into salt for my wounds. Flowers end in frozen patterns, artificial gardens cover the floors, we get up close to midnight, search with powerful lights, the tiniest shrubs on the meadows, a stream desperately is running to the ocean. And I'm gonna hand it over to our first opening reader, Ali Ong. Wow, thank you so, so much for that beautiful poem. Um, what, a, what a gorgeous tribute to our new ancestor. Um, thank you all for being here. I'm going to read a poem called, You Deserve the World. During this latest shiny new catastrophe, while I lie in bed and luxuriate in the silk of my sadness, a friend's text lights up my screen. You deserve the world. Not this world, hostile and unkind, but the one we are building in the lines of poems, in our wildest melatonin dreams, in the dirt of our gardens and the recipes passed down to us in a language that we have not yet forgotten. I catch glimpses of it in the tsunami of voices that floods the streets after another life is snatched from a mother's grasp, their demands for justice impossible to ignore. I feel it in my friend's deliberate knuckles, massaging coconut oil into my scalp, how their steady hands unworry my brow. Everywhere I look, aliveness. 
I open my cupboard to discover the plump red face of a tomato that I forgot to turn into pasta sauce, now blooming soft tufts of mold, the stubborn insistence of life in even the harshest conditions. I slice the tip of my finger while chopping cloves of garlic, and before the first drop of blood has blushed the counter, it coagulates at the edge of the wound. A miracle, this body, how it has already begun to heal before I've even registered the hurt. When I say you deserve the world, what I mean is this is not the first apocalypse we have survived. The world has ended before and before and before, and for some, there was no after. We have watched its rind cracking open like a freshly broken heart, and each time we build and rebuild. We kiss our houseplants on their leafy foreheads before we go to sleep. We dress our bodies in the most brilliant light. We dance like the empire is dying, water the ground where it once stood, and watch what blooms, lush and verdant in its wake. Thank you. Wow, it's such a gorgeous poem. Thank you for sharing that. I love, I love cooking poems. I love plant poems. Everything put together is just really, really wonderful. And our next reader is going to be Alexis Colazzo. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for having me. All right. So this is titled Party Girl. All right, she remembered the nights of not making it home, images too blurry to be called memories, the nights of always feeling alone. She remembered the walks of shame home, every wild night a simple distraction, busy days going through the motions. She remembered how easily darkness could be ignored, striving to a goal with a whole new life in store. Days haunted by the past, nights keep her running. She remembered childhood joys and tragedies, lingering traumas stripped away her light, consuming her mind, affecting her moods. She remembered never knowing how to feel, mocking smiles, laughing at death, crying for fun. Too brave to wanna die, foolish enough to try. She remembered everything except this growing fear. Thank you. Thank you, Alexis. I love the, I love the way you're using emotions in that, like the, the connection between memory and emotion. Ugh, so good. Um, our next reader is going to be Perry Rickard. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Perry Rickard. I am a white woman. I currently have wet brown hair. Behind me, there's really not much to see, and I'm drinking tea out of a catitude mug. And I am going to be reading a poem called When a Horse Leaves Her Stable. I awake to color. Yellows and reds of fall cradle my brain for the change to come. Tea kettle whistles, and my belly perks up. Calmness sinks and snuggles my inner turmoil. Rhythm of a song ebbs perfectly in tune with my heartbeat, befriending my hips motion. I am far from alone in my head. I am dancing with a band in a pink tutu stomping my rhinestones. Today is a sunny day. I eat pancakes at a park in my green watermelon dress. I tiptoe through air delicately woven together and waltz past the nod of an overgrown, overworn cowboy hat, an Arkansas mid-morning version of fist bumping. I sit on a rock at noon. There is no wind. I feel unswayed and seen by the sun. It stares in my eyes, forcing me to close them to daydream. I remember the world found inside my own brain is just as bright. The completely blue sky reminds me that not even a cloud blocks my path to reaching and resting on a star. 
a sack snacking sandwich too big for my face, much less my mouth, I bite anyway, hoping that the messiness is the experience. Maybe my taste buds deserve a party too. Four o'clock in the middle feeling lays siege. I am not energized or tired, but simply still. My thoughts stop combating. I just sit, I just stare. Nighttime charges forth. The hot water clocks farther than needed. Tenderly, it pricks my skin, washing and draining the layers that I hope to not see tomorrow. I dry off and place purple earrings into the opening on my lobe just to eat dinner on my couch. Purple makes my eyes sparkle. Purple makes me think maybe, just maybe, I am beautiful on the outside too. Striped fuzzy socks quietly glide over my too long for me pants. Will my short legs no longer trip over the frayed bottom? Will I not trip over my own fraying? I dive into richness of chocolate. Each morsel feels denser, wealthier than the last. I hope to love again. I kiss myself. Good night. Thank you. Thank you for reading that. I love, I love the quiet in that in this poem that also is so rich and so vivid. Descriptions of socks, the talking about chocolate, everything is just very, very tactile in a great way. The next reader that we're going to have is Ivana Fonte. Thank you, Sidi. Thank you, Pimaz. Um, my visual description is uh, dark curly hair. I'm wearing a uh, black clothes, a uh, pair of uh, glasses, a pair of earrings, and behind me there is a white door and a white wall. I would like to say hi to my brother and my mom. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, here is David. Um, um, I would like to read a poem called Migration in Spanish, it's called Migración. And I would like to read first the uh, first eight lines just to show you the, um, the rhythm and the sound. And then I'm going to read the translation made by David Brunson uh, for in, to English. So, well, I'm going to read the first eight lines um, in a moment, please. All right. Ajá. Migración. Dejar la tierra es herida y cicatriz. Algunos salen con un raspón de la primera caída desde la bicicleta o las marcas de las primeras vacunas. Otros exhiben en sus dedos cortes de papel, presentan documentos migratorios, solicitudes de asilo o refugio. Hay manos que presentan picaduras y ampollas. Now I'm going to read the translation. Migration. Living our land is wound and scar. Some go with scratches on their first bike crashes or pricks from the first, first, uh, their first vaccines. Others reveal the paper cuts on their fingers when they present their documents and ask for asylum or refuge. They are hands with stings and boils. They are beautiful sutures beneath expensive fabrics and hyaluronic acid. They are colloids too, then grow deformed by neglect, genetics, bad practices, unpaid premiums, or a hospital in ruins. Tall, short, big, and small, we wear the marks of knives, burns, and bullets. They are tattooed over scars, records, or and testimonies in ink. And the scars beneath the skin to that refer, resurface for photographs, nightmares, books, songs, the news, voices on WhatsApp call, messages listened to again and again. Living this land is repudiation and resilience, ruthlessness and longing. Stick to survive on this geopolitical patchwork quilt. Together, but soon up again. 
Thank you very much. Yvette, I love getting to hear you read your poem. I feel like <laughs> we, we get, and getting to hear Dave's translation and knowing he's there. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm really glad your family's here too. Hi, Ivana's family. We love you. Welcome. Um, our next poet is Copris. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, I am a black woman with long, uh, dark hair. I have on uh, white snake earrings, a multicolored dress, and my background um, is a beige uh, door and cabinets. Um, I'm going to be reading a poem by one of my favorite poets. Her name is uh, Rena P. Espayat, and the poem is called Bilingual Bilingue. My father liked them separate, one there, one here, aya yaki, as if aware that words might cut into his daughter's heart, el corazón, and lock the alien part to what he was, his memory, his name, su nombre, with a key he could not claim. English outside this door, Spanish inside, he said, y basta. But who can divide the world, the word, mundo y palabra from any child? I knew how to be dumb and stubborn, destaruda. Lay in bed, I hoarded secret syllables I read until my tongue, mi lingua, learned to run where his stumbled. And still the heart was one. I like to think he knew that even when proud orgulloso of his daughter's pen, he stood outside me versos, half in fear of words he loved, but wanted not to hear. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that poem with us. I love the rhyme, the sounds in this piece are really, really great to hear. Our next um, reader is going to be Robin Bruce. Hello, can you hear me? Great. So a visual description, I am a brown woman. I have curly hair and a scarf in my hair that is blue with flecks of magenta and a lavender dress with purple flowers. This is my poem, Susanna's Refrain. My tears fell for me, down from your throne of grace. I did not picture thee. Nobody ever asked me how I felt. Foggy mist, smell of damp, blue lit night. Tree ringlets rippled round aging knuckles. I'm old now, like the scented oak under golden light and heavy air where we first kissed. Brown skin in amber days, palm on shoulder blades steam rising from a hot fence. Around the darkened corner, I did not look for thee. Black eye to black eye, silent sovereignty and wet, turned dirt into mud for sparrows, spitting nests against the rough. My God, thank you, Robin. I love, especially there at the end, you have this like, this, the way you're reading that is there's so much like sensual shift, like black eye to black eye, silent sovereignty and wet. <laughs> so good, thank you. Um, our next poet is S. Langland. Hi, everybody, um, I'm S. Um, I am a white person. I have brown hair, bright blue eyes, and I'm wearing an orange turtleneck dress. Um, behind me are paintings and old books. Um, my poem is called Boatwright. 
Boat right. A sun washed baby blue sheet webs over what is left of my grandfather's mahogany ribbed and plywood skinned red boat. His shed's butterfly roof seems to hover over his handmade escape. Seventies brown pillars uphold this carport altar, this shed, sheltering the remains from the elements. The rain slings sideways. The hurricanes take people out of homes. We talk of wind chilled eyes and air brined mouths. We laugh, spitting kinship ivy to bay mouth. And now, my father. Ask me to drag this other father's life, his wood and salt, his one thing he ever really got right. And my father asked me, can I roll the boat out to the street for pickup? And I say, sure, of course we can, dad. And 20 years after my grandfather's death, I can't help but see that rotting boat filled with Walmart bags and never worn Goodwill clothes my grandmother hoards. And what good are those blue sheets doing the boat anyway? And why does my dad care so much about wheeling the metaphor away? Last Christmas, he told me to change a cardigan because it looked like a girl's sweater. And why can't I write a poem about that? Thank you. Thank you so much for reading that poem. Um, the ending is just fantastic. I mean, it just uh, on the page also, just the way it looks, the way it, the movement that it goes through, all of it works so well. Thank you. And our next reader is going to be Sophia Ordaz. Hi, um, I'm Sophia. I am um, a brown woman with long, dark hair, brown eyes. I have on um, my favorite fall sweater, it's burnt orange, and I'm in my bedroom, so it's kind of like nondescript, this angle, it's my um, dresser behind me. So the poem I'm going to read is a prose poem that it keeps shifting and evolving. I'm almost getting it there, um, but it's basically um, a letter of gratitude to my parents, among other things. It's called Love Interpreter. In Spanish, love feels multi-layered striated with gradations of romantic and platonic affection. Me gustas, me agradas, me encantas, te quiero, te amo. A switch from the intransitive to the transitive, from object to subject, materializing the intensity of the signified and the signifier, a perfect miracle of synchronicity. In English, the verb to love is bloated with use. I love the drunk girl in the club bathroom, like I love the feel of music coursing from speakers into my veins. Thunderstorms and vitamin D, serotonin, steamy showers, and soreness coiled in my muscles, not to mention the delicious thrill of a crush's finger resting easy on the inside of my wrist. And all that wit, wisdom, God, gods, mingos, matcha, mota, 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 oh my, my, my. I'm feeling high, what a day, what a day to love cardamom, cantaloupe, cocoa, kismet, carpe diem, and kindness. All those night skates, close shaves, second, third, and fourth chances, in addition to the way souls peer through eyes when they sparkle, and cats melt into liquids in their owner's arms, and children laugh ad infinitum, peel after peel after peel. It's 3 a.m., and I'm safe keeping teardrops on a friend's shoulder. I love that, and you, and the weather today. I grew up in a household where love is more often demonstrated than uttered. That passed on to me in the way I love you would lifelessly flop out my mouth instead of roll off the tongue like it did for white kids on Disney Channel. Yes, it used to be hard to say I love you back to my friends and to feel at home in the expression. Not anymore. I revel in the power of words and switch between connotations like languages. My parents I love yous know no bounds. He are but a few. Freshly cut fruit, rice and beans, carefully picked over secondhand clothing, my mother's feet swollen from cleaning houses all day, her teaching me how to read in Spanish, 
even as sleep weighed down her eyes, her blinking the tired away to read to me when I got too lazy to sound out the letters, my father staying up all night to help me with my homework, the way he would fix anything broken in the house, including my spirit, how I can always call him to tell if the mechanic is ripping me off. All the times I thought they were mad, but they were actually tired. The fact that they left every single thing they knew and loved for a country where they'd forever be racialized. All of it shouts, I love you, te queremos más que la vida. Los quiero más, I'd say as a child, stretching my arms as wide as they could go to quantify just how much I love them more, which was an impossible thing to say, but I know now that we can't stop ourselves from saying impossible things out of love. Theirs is the biggest love I will possibly ever know. And when you love someone like I love mis jefecitos more than life itself and the length of a child's outstretched arms, which is all your being can hold and all your mind can comprehend, you are a willing interpreter of love languages. There's just like so much in that poem, so much wisdom in that poem and so much like building and shifting I love that that line um I know now that we can't stop ourselves from saying impossible things out of love I mean fuck yeah um thank you our next poet is Carla Hernandez Torijos Are you here, Carla? Okay, Carla may not have made it. So we will invite you to read that poem. It's in the access document. And our next poet will be Deanna Starshine. Hello, I'm Deanna Starshine. Hi, I'm Deanna Starshine. I am a white trans woman. I am wearing a uh, sweater with horizontal stripes, which may or may not be flattering. There is a bookshelf to my right and a double beam bathroom balance to my left. Arkansas trans youth have suffered a slew of anti-trans legislation in Arkansas, including but not limited to House Bill 1570, the so-called SAFE Act, which bans some gender affirming care, even with parental consent. That law is on hold while the ACLU sues our Attorney General. And it's not just Arkansas. The Human Rights Campaign has counted nearly 200 mean-spirited bills targeting queer youth throughout the country. This poem is titled To the Trans Youth of Arkansas. Your gender's like your body. It is yours to hide if necessary or to flex. The answer isn't always obvious because you're human. You are more complex than bigots lead themselves to understand. They want to recreate a childhood where women served, minorities were banned, and rainbow folk were closeted for good, or so the bullies thought, but they were wrong. The world is singing past their monotone. Although they shatter glass for one last song at your expense, you are not alone. Community awaits you, gender queer. Whenever you come out, we'll be here. Thank you for listening. Uh, you can follow Deanna Starshine on Instagram or my, check out the podcast, Poetize with Deanna Starshine. Yeah, I was just going to say that Deanna is a longstanding member of the poetry community here in Arkansas and um, Poetize the News is also a series that is, if you're interested in poetry and political engagement, that's the place to be. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. We really thank appreciate you. you. Um, so actually, that is our last opening reader. Um, for the evening. And I am really excited to get to introduce you to our um, featured poet for tonight, Noor Hindi, um, who led a workshop this afternoon that led me, selfishly, I'm talking about this, to write the first poem that I've written like all the way through <laughs> in uh, probably like 18 months. I don't know. It's been a long ass time. <laughs> um, so um, I'll, I'll just read um, her bio real quick and then um, turn it over and we'll hear some poems. Does that sound good? All right. Um, so Noor Hindi is a Palestinian American poet and reporter. She's a 2021 Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Fellow. 
Her poems have appeared or are forthcoming in Poetry, Hobart, and Jubilat. Her essays have appeared or are forthcoming in American Poetry Review, Literary Hub, and Adroit Journal. Her debut collection of poems, Dear God, Dear Bones, Dear Yellow, is forthcoming from Haymarket Books. And you can visit her website at nordhandy.com and follow her on Twitter. Gwen will post that in the chat. Um, really excited to hear your poems tonight. I'm really grateful to have you here. And of course, just like grateful to have gotten to spend such creative, like beautiful time with you today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Molly. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, CD, Gwen, Molly, um, Megan, for all your hard work. Um, and thank you to all the readers and the space that you've cultivated. Uh, I had so much fun listening to your poems. Uh, for some reason, I was not able to click on the poems and actually like like see them, um, but uh, maybe it just might be my computer. I'm forgetting to do the visual background. I'm sorry about that. Um, I am an Arab American woman with light skin wearing uh, clear glasses with my hair tied and a plaid shirt with a white shirt underneath. Uh, and behind me is, I guess, like wooden walls. Um, my, my roommate, Delilah is, uh, she's making fun of me because I write about the color yellow because it's a source of hope. So, uh, she's saying, isn't your book titled Yellowettes? Cause that's what I wanted to do after I didn't actually want to do this was a joke. It was a, it was a Maggie Nelson joke. Um, anyway, so <laughs> I will ignore them. <laughs> and I can hear them laughing downstairs, which is actually really funny. <laughs> Um, I'm going to read a few poems and, and, and talk about them throughout. And please let me know if, uh, uh, if you can't hear me or if you're having any trouble, I'll keep an eye out on the comments and thank you again for the beautiful space that you've all cultivated today. It's really, really been supportive and a source of joy, um, on this Sunday. So, uh, the first one is. Uh, this is one of the first, either the first or one of the first in the forthcoming collection, which is called Dear God, Dear Bones, Dear Yellow, Not Yellowettes. Self-interrogation. At the airport terminal, a woman is crying. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. I need to focus on something besides the rush of migration, lights so loud, the unending sound of a newscaster's voice. Dear God, dear bones, dear mother, please forgive me. I want to call in dead. Last week, there was a child in a yellow dress reading a poem. For minutes on end, I could not be indifferent to anything. Not the grass dying yellow, not the bombs twisting limbs, not the cages, not the, yes. There is a woman crying at Terminal 6. Yes, I use a newspaper to cover my eyes. Yes, I think of the child, the ch tiny silver heart she placed in my palm, how I threw it in the trash seconds later. But I promise, I promise, I promise I meant it as an act of survival, maybe love. Thank you so much for listening to that. I actually, in the midst of uh, introductions, I, I want to actually start the reading by reading an Atel Adnan poem and uh, Molly uh, uh, beat me to it, but I will read a really short one. Um, I do appreciate that she, she did pass away. She has a huge, huge influence and uh, it was a sad thing to wake up to. Um, so this is, this is from the Arab Apop Apocalypse by Atel Adnan. In the dark irritation of the eyes, there is a snake hiding. In the exaltations of Americans, there is a crumbling empire. In the foul waters of the rivers, there are Palestinians. Out, out of its borders, pain has a leash on its neck. In the wheat stalks, there are insects vaccinated against bread. In the Arabian boats, there are sharks shaken with laughter. In the camel's belly, there are blind highways. Out, out of time, there is spring's shattered hope. In the deluge on our plains, there are no rains but stones. 
thank you for listening to that. I just wanted to bring her into the room today. Um, so the second poem I'm going to read is I once looked in a mirror but couldn't see my body. And this is after Ghassan Kanafani. I document as argument I exist. I learned this from watching my father alone in the night drawing and redrawing a map of Palestine, green ink. Before 1947, he would insist, before partition, before the nation became history, before my tongue mistook thank you for survival, before I chose an industry that headlines my people dead. A camera melts in the desert sun. From far away, I hear the dying clicks of its shutter, the loud bang of headlines slamming newspapers, the sharp gaze of eyeballs. Standing before my father, my own pupils, gaping at his calloused hands, I too wish to capture this moment, hold it, say yes. This violence is possible, and also there is pleasure in looking. But who is the audience of my looking, and how far does a hurt stretch before it yellows? It's really funny. I'm reading uh, actually from the open uh, mouth document, and and I, I don't know. It's it's anonymous something. He's like scanning through it. I'm like, where's the words? <laughs> but it's hilarious to me that Google Docs anonymous iguana, anonymous iguana, whoever you are. <laughs> I am not calling you out. <laughs> um, let me actually, I'm going to read from my own document. So that way all of you anonymous iguanas can, can fuck around in the document. Um, so I've been writing to give some uh, context. I've been writing about uh, the news and, and reporting for some time. Um, I spent about a year, I, I've, si I've since switched to... Um, I've moved to Michigan recently to Dearborn uh, and left my job. I spent about a year reporting on evictions during the pandemic, and I was uh, really frustrated often uh, by just the lack of impact we were having and feeling hopeless at, at what I was seeing. And so I, I started writing these breaking news poems, um, part of which was to like sort of troll reporters who hate poetry a little bit. And uh, part of it was just out of uh, some kind of way to channel some of my own creative spirit uh, in something and say the things that I couldn't say in the final report, but being able to put them in poems was helpful. And so this is one of a series of breaking news poems, um, breaking news. We'll wake up Sunday morning and read the paper, read each other, become consumers of each other's stories, a desperate reaching for another body's warmth, its words bleeding us through a world. We carry graveyards on our backs and I'm holding a lightning bug hostage in one hand. It's light dimming in the warmth of my fist and in, the, in another, a pen, to document its death. Isn't that terrible? I'll ask you, shutting my fist once more. In interviews, I frame my subject stories through a lens to make them digestible to consumers. I become a machine, a transfer of information. They become a plea for empathy. An oversaturation of feelings will fail at transforming into action. What's lost is incalculable. And at the summer, at the end of the summer, the swimming pools will be gutted of water and it'll be impossible to swim. Thank you for listening to that. Mm. Um, shout out to Anonymous Wolf. I see you. <laughs> I love y'all. I have a lot of love for this space. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Uh, here's another breaking news poem. Um, breaking news. I'm not a poet anymore. 
I've interviewed too many politicians. All they care for is ghosts. Breaking news, I'm breaking up with my stupid shame. I have dates on my calendar just for fucking. I do this between my nine to five. Hello, hello, I'm quieter than I seem. I'm a man in a suit. Please pass the damn hookah. Please tell the politicians I'm tired of reporting. We're all terrible. My desire to fix this window is corrupt. Your desire to call your looking through this window as an act of social justice is corrupt. At a protest, a white woman calls me fake news. Okay, fine, I tell her back. I don't smile anymore. I do the job so well. My apology, a cop, I outcry the eagle. My mother holds a butterfly to the sky. White winged glimmering mess. Someone please snap a photo. My shoes are drenched in blood. It's funny. I've since edited that poem on, um, and I was, I was trying to remember the, like I put a, I slipped a line in there that I, it's, uh, is not here. So it kind of tripped me up a little bit. Um, but yeah, thank you for listening. This is the last poem I'm going to read. Um, Super, super appreciate y'all joining on a Sunday evening. Uh, shout out to my roommates who are like downstairs in our kitchen watching. I, <laughs> I hate you a little bit for being here, but it's fine. <laughs> um, breaking news. We know death is futile. No death as 3.5 thousand retweets, a trauma, a thing named empty, an internet measured in the slow bend of your fingers, clicking the quiet tempo of expiration. Your spleen in the shape of a pen, in the shape of a pen, in the shape of a gun, I am going door to door collecting story. I place a tape recorder at the edge of a child stroller and watch her position it between her teeth, chew on story and argue she's agent of her own story. I dream of America as nightmare, as child placing drone in mouth, as mother placing drone in child's mouth to condition her tongue to the taste of America, I see you. Door to door in eviction court, I attend and a judge asks to see my face so I show her my blood. At the edge of survival, an audience of witness, of whiteness, sir, why are you being evicted? Which history, what system, I know your trauma is a thing we'll name breaking news, your trauma, a hunger we crave, your trauma behind a paywall, your trauma we measure with clicks, I document futility to feed America more story muddled by story, there is a child crying in front of a pink wall as her home is demolished in Palestine. It moves one to tears to watch your own reflection on a screen, your face in anguish at another's pain looks so sweet, almost heroic. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for reading, and for being with us and for sharing in the humor of the iguanas and the wolves and the chameleons scrolling through the document. I love them. I want to, I, I, I felt so, uh, I felt so less alone. <laughs> like I, I want them to be at all of my readings now. <laughs> it's like a companion text almost. Yeah. It's like, yeah. It was like following me on the page. I yeah. Like, Great. <laughs> like this iguana is with me. This iguana is on my bullshit too. I, <laughs> And there's like there's, there's there's this like interesting piece of it which is almost almost kind of like what we were talking about earlier today right that's like this we're talking about the blood you know right there's like I think there's yeah. literally a moment where there's like the word blood and it says anonymous iguana next to it and it's like this sort of mashing up of like what's silly and what's yeah what yeah we, you need to take seriously yeah, yeah. Uh, it's beautiful it's it's weird I love living in the weird the weird yeah, yeah.
Thank you so much to everyone for being here, for listening. Um, this is one of like the most wholesome uh, poetry spaces I've been in. So I really, uh, I really do mean that. Mm -hmm.